That was really good to hear. And, you know, it's been really good catching up with you, Peterson. The check? Thank you. Nope. I insist. My treat. Okay, fine. If you insist. Okay. <gasps> What's that? Oh, no. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi, welcome back to the channel. This is it. The final chapter of 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos. Will Peterson cohesively tie everything from the book together? Or will we get a slightly strange story where Peterson tries to justify all the rules? Unless this is the first video of mine you're catching, you should know the answer to that question. This won't be the final video in the series, though. We'll do one more where we look at the surface level messages and gist of all the chapters in the book and the deeper level implications and stuff buried in there. Anyways, one last official visual cue reminder for who's talking in these. This means I'm paraphrasing the book. This means I'm responding to the book or integrating my opinions with science either references Peterson supplied or things I'm bringing to the party. Alrighty, let's get to the final scene of this lobster opera. At some point in 2016, Peterson met up with a friend who happened to have with him a pen that lit up at the tip when writing. Now, at first, Peterson didn't think much of it, but then it became a slight obsession. Later, in a more metaphorical frame of mind, I was struck quite deeply by the idea of a pen of light. There is something symbolic about it, something metaphysical. We're all in the dark after all, much of the time. We could all use something written with light to guide us a long time. We could all use something written with light to guide us along our way. He says later here, which makes it sound like this musing happened after he'd parted ways with his friend, but that wasn't the case. I told him I wanted to do some writing while we sat and conversed, and I asked him if he would give me the pen as a gift. When he handed it over, I found myself inordinately pleased. Now I could write illuminated words in the darkness. This makes him sound like such a child. He's supposed to be there meeting with his friend, but he just has to play with that pen. And it's not that he's just going to scribble with it absentmindedly while enjoying his friend's company. Oh no, that wouldn't be true to Peterson's character. Obviously, it was important to do such a thing properly. So I said to myself, in all seriousness, what shall I do with my newfound pen of light? There are two verses in the New Testament that pertain to such things. I've thought about them a lot. Can't misuse that novelty pen. Huge responsibility. Wow. Bible verses in question are Matthew 7-7 7, 7 and 7-8. 7, it's a part about ask and get, seek and find, action and positive consequence. Pearson warns us that this doesn't mean that God is some magical wish granter. He reminds us that even his son, Self, wasn't willing to call in a favor as discussed in Rule 7. And then he brings up the desperate people whose prayers go unanswered. But maybe this is because the questions they contain are not phrased in the proper manner. Perhaps it's not reasonable to ask God to break the rules of physics every time we fall by the wayside or make a serious error. Perhaps, in such times, you can't put the cart before the horse and simply wish for your problem to be solved in some magical manner. Perhaps you could ask, instead, what you might have to do right now to increase your resolve, buttress your character, and find the strength to go on. Perhaps you could instead ask to see the truth. Right. Prayer totally works. You just have to be doing it right. Also, Make sure you're not bothering God in your prayer. He's a busy guy after all. Also, also, set your expectations right. Don't expect prayer to do anything in any measurable way. It can't be that there isn't someone up there listening or the act of prayer is more metaphorical than literal. Nope, you have to pray for stat bonuses, otherwise it doesn't work. Slight pivot, and now's as good a time as any to ask, What's all this doing here in the book wrap up? It seems like the stuff that's bookended by the pen story could have gone into the rules at some point, but here it is. Peterson shares that in disagreements with his wife, they have a strategy for how to proceed forward, even when the disagreement or rift between them feels too big to mend. 
fight breaks out, and it's not said, but I imagine it continues for a little bit because what's a heated discussion? What's an argument? Anyways, fight happens, and then the Peterson partner dispute process starts. And that basically involves the two parties going into separate rooms to think about what they did. The mental image I get for this is a little funny, depending on how it actually works in practice. So I would imagine that the Peterson partner dispute process is something that has to be called by one of them in the middle of a fight, like, hey, rooms. Uh, if that's not the case, do they just have a discussion that eventually turns into a fight? They realize this is what happened and they silently just stop talking and go to their separate rooms? We'll get to the end of this thought before I share my opinion on this approach. We would each ask ourselves the same single question. What had we each done to contribute to the situation we were arguing about? However small, however distant, we had each made some error. Then we would reunite and share the results of our questioning. Here's how I was wrong. In true Peterson fashion, the identified problem with the partner dispute process is that you won't like the answer brought about by the question. When you're arguing with someone, you want to be right and you want the other person to be wrong. Then it's them that has to sacrifice something and change, not you. And that's much preferable. Is this always the case? Counterexample. For some manipulative people I've known, an argument isn't so much about being right as it is about being able to be right. To clarify, I'm making a distinction between arguing because you think you're in the right and the other person's in the wrong, and arguing because you want your side to be right actual rightness or wrongness not factoring into things. You could basically boil this down to gaslighting. Or there's arguments where you're not really fighting about rightness and wrongness so much as trying to get the other person to recognize or understand your side. You could be in the right or wrong, but still would like the other person to understand that what happened made you feel awful or unimportant or some other negative emotion. Or there's a factor of emotional exhaustion. If you're tired or burned out or just emotionally drained, something that could normally just be talked out can spark off into a huge fight. If it's you that's wrong and you that must change, then you have to reconsider yourself, your memories of the past, your manner of being in the present, and your plans for the future. Then you must resolve to improve and figure out how to do that. Then you actually have to do it. That's exhausting. It takes repeated practice to instantiate the new perceptions and make the new actions habitual. <laughs> It's much easier just not to realize, admit, and engage. It's much easier to turn your attention away from the truth and remain willfully blind. Okay, opinion time. For reasonable, normal-ish people, this advice isn't bad. But in the wrong hands, this could be very bad advice. If you're in a relationship with someone manipulative and you don't really know it yet, and you have this outside authority telling you that you're just being stubborn and you need to see the other person's side, it's a dangerous combination. Peterson two box problem comes up again. But it's at such a point that you must decide whether you want to be right or you want to have peace. You must decide whether to insist upon the absolute correctness of your view or to listen and negotiate. You don't get peace by being right. You just get to be right while your partner gets to be wrong, defeated and wrong. Do that 10,000 times and your marriage will be over or you will wish it was. Reference to 16 is a book chapter by Peterson, thankfully supplied with a link to a free version. In a somewhat postmodern opening, he says that there are facts, and there are facts. When people are fighting, they have different versions of the truth. The job of the peacemaker is to get the truthy facts as the consensus point. And then we're deep into the style madness, with competition, pragmatism, and different environmental scopes. Pardon my bluntness, but it's a lot of words about very little. But sure, it's in line with the argument made in the quote. But what if you're right? What if you're totally 100% in the right? You still have to negotiate? Somehow, in shooting for a more nuanced approach in dealing with relationship conflict, he's missed some nuance of the possible right and wrong states. What, no dominance hierarchy in the relationship? Color me shocked. I was going to say something about 10,000 seeming outlandish, but then I did the math, and... The number of days that Dr. Mr. The Husband and I have been together, we're three quarters of the way there. If there had been some level of conflict on every single day, it's definitely plausible. But 
don't keep score of these things. Not that that's what Peterson's saying to do. To choose the alternative, to seek peace, you have to decide that you want the answer more than you want to be right. That's a way out of the prison of your stubborn preconceptions. That's a prerequisite for negotiation. That's to truly abide by principle of rule two. Treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. Once again, two boxes. Either be right, making your partner wrong and presumably resentful, or everybody comes to the table with their own wrongdoing as a foundation for negotiation. No space for one person to just have been in the wrong and admit to it and own it, or for the real problem to have been the situation and how it was handled by everybody. Nope, those don't fit into the two boxes, so we're not going to talk about it. That being said, this advice isn't that bad. If you can incorporate the other right and wrong states, for example. But you need to be able to trust your partner for this to work. If you are in a relationship with somebody who's manipulating you or abusing you, this type of tactic can be used against you pretty easily. Peterson says that he and his wife have learned that when left with their own thoughts in this partner dispute process, they're each able to remember something stupid and wrong they did from the depths of their mind. Here's where I start to have a problem with this procedure. In my experience, sometimes I know what I did to annoy my husband. Sometimes. But more often than not, I don't know what I did to annoy him. And the opposite's also true. I can be annoyed or upset by things my husband does. And if I don't communicate that to him, he'd never know. I need to communicate it to him promptly and indicate the severity of it because otherwise it can keep happening. And that's no bueno. In either case, one person is being made unhappy by the actions of the other person. So if this escalates into a fight, if it doesn't, why does the person who is being made unhappy by the actions of the other person have to bring their own sins to the table? Now certainly, negotiations can and should take place for how to handle a situation in the future. Simplified example from when my husband has to work in a mine. Hey, it really sucks not hearing from you all day. I worry and it'd be nice to know that you're okay. Hey, yeah, I hear you, but the internet can be really spotty down there or we just don't have the time. Okay, I hear that. Kinda sucks, but how about you let me know when you reach site and then when you're back on surface heading home? I can do that. Done. No needing to bring my own sins to the table for this negotiation to work. No major mea culpa from him because that's just how working in a mind goes. But the situation could have been handled differently if a different approach had been taken. And having to plumb the depths of their minds for something stupid or wrong they did, it sounds like sometimes you have to dig pretty far to find an offering for the partner dispute procedure. And that procedure will just keep kicking an error until both parties have an I did a bad entry. Sounds like a bug, not a feature. But I'm sorry, Peterson, I cut you off mid-thought. Please continue. Then you can go back to your partner and reveal why you're an idiot and apologize sincerely. And that person can do the same for you and then apologize sincerely. And then you two idiots will be able to talk again. Being able to stay level with your partner is helpful, so this two idiots thing did make me chuckle. Being able to own up and take responsibility for your part of a fight is important, don't get me wrong, but this is still requiring both parties to have been idiots. This almost sounds more like just disengaging from the fight to cool down. The one question is something to think about while you're cooling down, but maybe the more important part is getting out of the heated situation before it can escalate further and then coming back to the problem with a cooler head. Linking this back to the nature of prayer from earlier. Perhaps that is true prayer. The question, what have I done wrong? And what can I do now to set things at least a little bit more right? But your heart must be open to the terrible truth. You must be receptive to that which you do not want to hear. When you decide to learn about your faults so that they can be rectified, you open a line of communication with the source of all revelatory thought. Maybe that's the same thing as consulting your conscience. Maybe that's the same thing, in some manner, as a discussion with God. Is it now? I don't see how getting feedback on how you could improve opens you up to revelatory thought, aside from possibly needing to consult with others on what you could change. I can buy this as being like tapping into your conscience as an indicator of what you could be doing better, but God? Really? It was in that spirit, with some paper in front of me, 
that I asked this question. What shall I do with my newfound pen of light? I asked, as if I truly wanted the answer. I waited for a reply. I was holding a conversation between two different elements of myself. I was genuinely thinking, or listening, in the sense described in Rule 9. Assume that the person you're listening to might know something you don't. I can't stop imagining what this must have been like for his friend. It was me, of course, who asked the question. And it was me, of course, who replied. But those two me's were not the same. I did not know what the answer would be. I was waiting for it to appear in the theater of my imagination. I was waiting for the words to spring out of the void. How can a person think up something that surprises him? How can he already not know what he thinks? Where do new thoughts come from? Who or what thinks them? In this context, it almost reminds me of some of the tests I took in higher ed, like in physio. Sitting there with the pen, just trying to will the answer to come out of whatever dark recess of my mind it had hidden itself in. But this also kind of sounds like letting your unconscious take the wheel and write, and that just... He doesn't explicitly say he's getting this knowledge from the collective wisdom of our ancestors or anything, but... Yeah. Since I'd just been given, of all things, a pen of light which could write illuminated words in the darkness, I wanted to do the best thing I could do with it. So, I asked the appropriate question, and almost immediately, an answer revealed itself. Write down the words you want inscribed on your soul. I wrote that down. That seemed pretty good. A little bit on the romantic side, granted, but that was in keeping with the game. Respond in the pinned comment what you would like inscribed on your soul. I think I'd probably go with something like, nothing is true, everything is permitted, but I'm a bit of a dork, so... I agree that this is 100% cheese-fest romanticism, but I kind of low-key sympathize. I have more than one journal that I bought with a clear intent to do something with, and then it comes time to write in it or put pictures in it or art in it or whatever, and I just can't bring myself to do it. I don't want to tarnish the pages with my trite bullshit and stupid pictures, so there it sits, unblemished with all the other journals. I guess in this instance, I'll be kettle to Peterson's pot. Peterson kept going by asking himself the hardest questions he could come up with. If you have a pen of light, after all, you should use it to answer difficult questions. The rest of this chapter follows a question response pattern, so that's what we'll roll with. Presumably, these will be the difficult questions. I'll note that he also breaks up these questions into different conceptual chunks, so those will be the different parts of this video. And sometimes he has question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, explanation. Sometimes he has question, answer, explanation, question, answer, explanation. So for the most part, we're just going to do question, answer, and then the relevant explanation. What shall I do with tomorrow? the most good in the shortest period of time. He notes his pleasure at the simplicity of this maximally efficient answer. Cool. Good to have that sort of goal in the back of your mind, but what if my tomorrow is just editing this video? I guess the case could be made that I'm doing a good in this time of social distancing by staying here and not going anywhere, but I probably wasn't going to go anywhere anyways, so... What shall I do next year? Try to ensure that the good I do then will be exceeded only by the good I do the year after that. Peterson was again pleased, this time by the ambition of this goal. Sounds like an okay goal, but add in a little bit of nuance or gray in that sometimes these things just don't work out. Build in that allowance for failure, and that's just how life is sometimes. The friend Peterson was out with, who he took the pen from, if you remember, got to be the first to hear these question and answer pairs that were being drawn out of him by this magical pen of light. And Peterson said that the first two pairs of question and answers, of which there ends up being about 30 spoilers, resonated with this friend. What are you writing? I don't know. I just feel compelled to write by this amazing pen. What shall I do tomorrow? What shall I do next year? These answers are truly inspired. Yeah. 
Are you feeling okay? What shall I do with my life? Aim for paradise and concentrate on today. Pearson writes about a bit of a eureka moment he had because he knew what his answer meant to his own question. Going back to one of his apparent favorites, to him, this is like Geppetto wishing on a star in Disney's Pinocchio. Wishing for a puppet to be a real boy is apparently equivalent to the Sermon on the Mount, which is included in text as it was in Roll 4. Pearson's take on both of these is to keep your always important aim set on heaven while diligently fiddling around on earth, and or keep your focus on the future while in the now to perfect both. It's been a bit, but Rule 4 involved a decent surface message, followed by some tearing down the reader, atheists aren't really atheists, and the instruction to not think. The context for the Jesus speech in that chapter was to set your aim on the betterment of being and live in the now, but not blinded by yourself. I'll point out now, as I did then, that my understanding of the part Peterson included of the sermon isn't so much about general life advice, although it can be taken to mean that, but a response to people joining the original-ish group wondering how the heck they were going to function if they did everything asked of them. Answer? Don't worry about it. Devote your life to God, and he'll take care of you. A true daddy. I don't quite see how the rule about not comparing yourself to others answers what should I do with my life, but I'm not the New York Times bestselling author. So I just used the pen to sign the check, and there's people waiting for the table to open up. It's pretty cold outside, and I'd hate to keep them waiting if we're done here. What shall I do with my wife? Treat her as if she is the Holy Mother of God, so that she may give birth to the world-redeeming hero. You need to honor the sacred mother role of your wife. Where that puts someone like me, who has no wife to honor, I'm not sure. Hitler and Stalin both had moms, so something must have gone wrong there. Reference to 17 is to an encyclopedia of child behavior and development that I can't find online. Google Scholar has it as being referenced twice once by 12 rules, and an article, essay, that seems a bit sus. Working from the title, we can talk a little about Eric Erickson's psychosocial development theory, just not from Peterson's source. Eric Erickson put forward a womb-to-tomb theory of development that built on Freud's work. Instead of emphasizing the psychic energy focused on erogenous zones and psychological conflicts arising from that, Erickson's emphasis was more on social relationships and crises tied to those. For both Freud and Erickson, if you didn't successfully resolve the conflict at that stage of development, it would be a continuing cause of trouble for you until you do. Erickson's theory had eight stages. The trust versus mistrust of Peterson's reference being the first stage said to occur in infancy. The conflict here is if the baby can trust their mother, meaning if the mom is warm, consistent, and reliable in caregiving or not. If the mom is able to be those things, then the baby can learn to trust and grow close to other people. If the mom isn't able to be those things, then the baby will grow up into somebody with trust issues. As I talked about in my Freud video, the issue of testability is also a problem for Erickson's developmental theory. There have been some useful ideas, like putting the teenage years as when people start playing around with their identity, but it hasn't really had empirical lasting power. So. Peterson bringing in this Erickson stage of development when talking about Hitler and Stalin. I guess the implication from that reference would be that they grew up into the people they did because their mothers weren't warm, reliable, or consistent. I understand the need to try and find some concrete reasons for why some people can commit astoundingly awful acts, but to infer that their moms weren't able to Freud or Erickson their way out of a psychodynamic conflict is a bit much. Peterson perhaps and maybe is an explanation that the mothers of human monsters weren't reminded enough about their duties as a mom, or maybe motherhood wasn't valued by their spouses or cultures, because of course those little babies need to grow up to maintain the balance between order and chaos. Right. It was Mrs. Hitler and Mrs. Stalin's fault that those two grew up into the adults they did who did the things they did. I'm not discounting the impact that our childhood can have on us, but 
to lay the blame so squarely at the mom's feet? What shall I do with my daughter? Stand behind her? Listen to her? Guard her? Train her mind? And let her know it's okay if she wants to be a mother. Stand behind her to support her? Or because she's the expendable one in the grand scheme of things? Fair chow, if you will. The explanation for this is that daughters absolutely need to be encouraged, but also basically need to remember their place. Personal ambition and drive and goals are all well and good, but family and children need to come first. Furthermore, societies that lose sight of the sacred role of mother cease to be. Maybe this is wrapped up in some of the negative feelings Peterson has for the postmodern neo-Marxists, whatever that is, but with modern feminism, it's okay to be a mom. It's also okay to not be a mom. Let's be more inclusive and say parent. It's even okay to want to be a homemaker. As long as everybody is making an informed choice and is consenting to it, cool. I detest the idea that a person, in my case a woman, and also in what Peterson's talking about, a woman, is not complete without children. True story. The first ban on this channel actually went to somebody who started at me in the comments about my need to have children. Trailing spouse video, I mentioned I don't have kids, this is our choice. And this person starts coming at me like, no, you need to have kids. It'll fill the hole in your life. It'll fix things. It'll make your time not spent working more meaningful. And this went on for some time before finally them telling me that I couldn't be an adult without children. Bye bye How about my reproductive business is none of yours? The idea of the family is so myopic in the West. Well, it's particularly in white, the West, because if you look at like some Hispanic families, it goes out and includes like great grandparents, great grand aunts or whatever. And it's a very large family structure, not just the nuclear family that like I was raised in. There've been many family structures that have been successful since we've been doing the whole raising offspring thing. It doesn't always have to be the dad bringing home the resources, the mom raising the kids to repeat the cycle themselves when they grow up. We can be so much more than that. Why limit us to this sacred mother role? What shall I do with my parents? Act such that your actions justify the suffering they endured. Your ancestors struggled and sometimes died in an effort to give their children a better life. Appreciate it. My maternal grandfather and his family did have to sacrifice a bit to get him out of proto-Nazi Germany. My paternal great-great-grandparents probably got out of Prussia because things weren't going so hot for them there. I am thankful for the random choices and hard work of my ancestors that lets me be here today. But I can also call out the bullshit like my grandfather abusing my dad, or the misogynistic society that was just the norm for so much of our history. True story. And trying to dig up my roots a little bit, because that's what we Americans love to do, uh, I found out that my great-great-grandmother, who came from Prussia to the US with her husband, was listed on one census as being illiterate, and then on the next census as being able to read. And I always thought that was pretty badass, especially given the time period and their income level. Back on topic. Things don't have to go into the good or bad bins. There's room for nuance. What shall I do with my son? Encourage him to be a true son of God. Pearson explains that this means that he needs to have his son do the right thing and support him doing so. This ties into the themes of sacrifice in that doing the right thing may end up at odds with worldly progress, safety, or even staying alive. Okie dokie. Maybe I was wrong about the daughter being the expendable one. What shall I do with the stranger? Invite him into my house and treat him like a brother so that he may become one. This one means to give people a chance to act positively so they can later return the favor. First glance, cool. Sort of a golden rule type thing. But sometimes this can be dangerous advice if you're out alone. Some people take advantage of the kindness of strangers. Ted Bundy springs to mind. I'm not saying to never help people, but to use your best judgment on if it's a good idea to do that or not. What shall I do with a fallen soul? Offer a genuine and cautious hand 
but do not join him in the mire. The reader is reminded that this is the gist from rule three. Specifically, that's an injunction to refrain both from casting pearls before swine and from camouflaging your vice with virtue. Recall that part of rule three was the assertion that helping people was a narcissistic, self-serving action, which I argued against. And the only way I can hear Pearls Before Swine is the name of a comic strip I enjoyed in grad school. I should get back to reading that. Anyways, surface level message. Sure, don't let others drag you down with them when you're trying to help them. But of course, Lobster Daddy can't just leave it at that. Although the book would be substantially shorter if he did. What shall I do with the world? Conduct myself as if being is more valuable than non-being. This is flagged as calling back to rule one, specifically not to let the tragedy of existence drag your figurative or literal shoulders down. You need to keep that chin held high with faith and courage. Going from the question and answer, living your life like you would rather be alive than dead is probably sound advice. Making choices that allow you to keep living your best life possible is reasonable. Knitting in the tragedy of existence is a Peterson flair that I just can't bring myself to be surprised by anymore. How shall I educate my people? How do I reach these kids? Share with them those things I regard as truly important. This is apparently tied to rule eight. Find out the truth by aiming up, then sharing that with others. It's taken me to the very last chapter of this book to realize that there should be a caveat in aiming up. If you aim straight up, you won't be able to buy the sequel. The Chaos Dragon has finally come for my brain. It was a good run. We could use a bit less of everyone finding their truths and sharing them as loudly as they can. Current situation, virality of allegations of voter fraud, just everything. What shall I do with a torn nation? Stitch it back together with careful words of truth. His explanation here is that the way to address the rift between the right and the left is to speak our naked truths to each other, find commonality, and then move forward. He doesn't say to hold hands and sing songs, but it kind of feels consistent with the tone. Part of what makes the truth naked is that it isn't justifying ideologies or supporting ambition. I have to keep reminding myself that this has been an absurdly wild year, and that this book was published in the long, long ago time of 2018. But despite Peterson's best efforts, the rift has grown. Substantially, given everything that's happened in this clusterfuck of a year. The case could be made that the ideology has dug in its heels a bit on both sides, but when one side is kind of starting to walk down a fascist path, maybe it's not the best time to scold the other side for getting a bit assertive. And even then, the rise of Peterson was really kicked off by Canadian Bill C-16, which he was vocally against. A bill, not about fucking compelled speech and arresting people for accidentally using the wrong pronouns for somebody, but about the federal government not getting to discriminate against LGBT people, and something that was already part of the Ontario Provincial Code. Oh, hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Such a snark. Such a snark. Oh no. Oh no. Is that your arm? I need that arm. I know you're saying no, but I need that arm. As shown in the Rise of Jordan Peterson documentary, he talked around his belief that he was doing the best for people by not using their pronouns. Lobster Daddy knows best, after all. But in doing this, he's ignoring their naked truth. Although with what we've seen in the book, anybody with a non-traditional gender identity or role would probably be put in the ideologically driven box, and therefore invalid. What shall I do for God my Father? Sacrifice everything I hold dear to yet greater perfection. This is very briefly linked back to Rule 7 in needing to sacrifice the old to grow. 
as demonstrated by Cain and Abel. I guess that yes, Peterson is going to casually throw in an extremely biblical sort of reference with next to no elaboration. Other Coda Q&A pairs have gotten a bit of explanation that I've summarized down. This has two sentences. And Rule 7 was about sacrificing stuff. I do remember that. But this framing of sacrificing all to God my Father for perfection? Yeah, I can totally see how to just readily apply that in somebody's life. What shall I do with the lying man? Let him speak so that he may reveal himself. That answer would be a good subtitle for the series. Thanks, Dr. P. Rule 9 and Matthew 7.16-20 are included as the initial explanation here. That New Testament passage being about knowing the goodness of people, or plants, by their fruits, and chopping down and burning the corrupt trees. Peterson says that you have to know the rot before you can replace it with something sound, a la Rule 7. It's been a hot minute since we covered Rule 9. I had to check my notes. Rule 9 included the story from the client who told Peterson she thought she'd been raped. Oh, and there was some stuff about thinking being like avatars representing different thoughts needing to defeat each other so that the superior thought prevailed, and if you aren't sophisticated enough to do that on your own, you have to outsource that process to others. Plus an adaptation of Roger's active listening, and Peterson's classification of the different types of conversations. Basically, he doesn't talk about lying in there, so just throwing in a Bible verse doesn't clarify things. This Q&A about liars is flagged as pertinent for the next pair. How shall I deal with the enlightened one? Replace him with the true seeker of enlightenment. Peterson says, there is no enlightened one, only the process of getting more enlightened. Proper being is a journey, man, not a destination. That's why rule four was so important. You have to keep seeking the truth, not desperately cling to the certainty that is eternally insufficient. And you have to make peace with your insufficiency so you can continually fix it. Okay, so if we lose the framing and flesh out some of this, it's not horrible? Working on improving yourself by yourself instead of following somebody who's claiming to be enlightened isn't bad advice. The line between an enlightened one and someone also on the path helping you out can be a bit hazy, especially in Peterson's vocal online fanbase. Peterson seems to include himself in the working on it box, but that isn't clear from how thou shalt do X this book can be. Also, this encouragement to continually improve yourself is okay, but I think it should be tempered by realistic expectations. It's okay if you're good with where you're at, either in part or in whole. Don't feel like you have to be fixing something just because. That seems like the surefire way to hunt down enlightened ones who are more than happy to tell you what's wrong with you for a price. I'm glad you're enjoying the pen, but I did just pay, so it kind of hit the road. What shall I do when I despise what I have? Remember those who have nothing and strive to be grateful. I'm going to include a bit of the explanation here verbatim so you can see what the writing style is now. Take stock of what is right in front of you. Consider rule 12, somewhat tongue in cheek. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. Consider as well that you may be blocked in your progress, not because you lack opportunity, but because you have been too arrogant to make full use of what already lies in front of you. That's rule six. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Very rapid fire without much elaboration. I understand that the coda in something like a ballet would be the cast coming out to do a final thing so that the audience can appreciate everybody, but as a rhetorical writing device, it's not working out so well. It's more like the member berries from South Park, remember those? And other directives that Peterson just didn't include before now. Anyways, there's more explanation for this pairing. Pearson describes a conversation with a young guy about his journey of self-improvement, from painfully shy shut-in to living on his own. Without force, without perishing, from the Tao Te Ching is fully included, before Peterson says this young man has accepted his lowly state and started the journey up instead of festering in resentment and rage. The Q&A pair doesn't really seem that related to the supporting elaboration. 
And being grateful for what you have is not bad advice. But as Peterson himself says, you can work on improving things. What shall I do when greed consumes me? Remember that it is truly better to give than to receive. He, again, calls back to rule seven to say that we need to trade and share. And giving is making everything better, which results in other people doing the same, which then results in everything improving. I'm going to stop pointing out when the Q&A pair doesn't match the elaboration because it's happening too frequently. As we've talked about throughout the book, I want to see the best in people and give them chances to do good. But as the state of the world demonstrates, goodwill and acts alone aren't enough to change things, especially when people like corporations are involved. What shall I do when I ruin my rivers? Seek for the living water and let it cleanse the earth. This pair was apparently unexpected for Peterson. He puts this with rule six and says that our environmental problems may be best thought of as psychological rather than technical. Get people to care about themselves and then they'll do what's best for the world. Then he shifts to say that perhaps this whole environmental problem is actually spiritual at its core before concluding this part with if we put ourselves in order, perhaps we'll do the same for the world. Of course, what else would a psychologist think? Reference 219 is about a real environmentalist, a Dutch guy behind a project to deal with the plastic in the ocean. The overt religious tone of the pairing is ignored by Peterson, so I guess we will too. This psychologist defers to climatologists, ecologists, and other people who study climate change, because this psychologist can take her head out of her ass for five minutes and read the room, and not blame people for being a little bit frightened about a looming extinction event. Corporations are not going to suddenly start caring about the environment until it cuts into their profits. How much longer are you going to be at this? Oh, come on. Are you tired? This is hardly a crisis. What shall I do when my enemy succeeds? Aim a little higher and be grateful for the lesson. Matthew 5:43 to 45 is included, the love your enemy part, then explain to mean that you need to pay attention to what your enemy's doing. Learn from their successes and critiques so you can implement them and make yourself better, which will at some point make them better too. Okay, sure, that'll totally work out. I'm starting to get a little impatient here, howdy. What shall I do when I'm tired and impatient? Gratefully accept an outstretched helping hand. Peterson finds two meanings in this. First, you have your limits. Second, you have people in your life that can help you when you reach your limits. No complaints here? We're not getting any younger. What shall I do with the fact of aging? Replace the potential of my youth with the accomplishments of my maturity. Socrates and Yeats are thrown out to bat for this explanation. A life lived thoroughly justifies its own limitations. I'm not entirely sure how the trial and death of Socrates helps me cope with aging. Nor this quote from Yeats here. Guess I'm more of a rage against the dying of the light sort of person. What shall I do with my infant's death? Hold my other loved ones and heal their pain. I know, I said I wasn't going to point out the mismatch between these, but this elaboration has nothing to do with babies dying. Peterson says that you have to be strong because death is a part of living. Apparently, he tells students to be the person that others could unload their grief on at their own father's funeral. This is noted as being superior to wishing for an untroubled life. Peterson, what the hell? You're allowed to grieve at your own father's funeral. If you're able to be strong for others, cool, but don't put that out as a golden standard for people to try to meet. Let people grieve how they need to. Fuck. And I'm going to go low for this, because this is bullshit. At time of writing, my understanding is both of his parents are still around, as are his kids. Don't instruct other people how to deal with a type of death and grief that you yourself haven't had to face yet especially in the stoic manner. Let people have the emotions that they need to have. You should know better. What shall I do in the next dire moment? 
Focus my attention on the next right move. Doom is always just over the horizon, as discussed in Rule 10, and he calls the biblical flood story archetypal because of this. When shit hits the fan, the only consistent thing you'll have is your character, so if you mess that up, you'll fail, and God help you. I get that you need to be prepared for what seems like the next inevitable bad thing to happen, because that's just how life is. But this grandiose language seems like it's setting up readers to be hyper-vigilant about major bad things and constantly bracing for them. Sometimes you need room to just breathe. You can let your guard down. Pearson goes back to talking about death and how it can bring families closer together and remind people not to take those in their lives for granted. Again, let people grieve how they need to. Don't feel bad if a family member's passing doesn't turn into a hallmark moment for the remaining family. Not everybody's family is like that. But, as we recently covered in Rule 12, time with those you care about is precious. Come on, Peterson, I'm starting to feel guilty about holding this table. What shall I say to a faithless brother? The king of the damned is a poor judge of being. And the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This heathen can do it too. But let's see what the explanation is before jumping to conclusions. Calling back to rule six, Peterson says the way to fix the world is to fix yourself. Trying to do more than that can bring harm because of your ignorance and lack of skill. But don't feel bad about that. You have plenty to work on already. If you don't work on that, full chaotic doom spiral into any of the negative outcomes we've talked about in the book already. And if you've spiraled yourself into hell, you're certainly not one to judge others. <clears throat> I argued against the many doom spirals in this book. Randomly pick a video and you'll probably find at least one. I disagree that improving yourself and the world are mutually exclusive, and that being imperfect precludes you from being able to try to make the world a better place. It's so amazing that this novelty pen is letting you pull these questions and answers out of your head in such a structured and organized fashion. Clearly, any book you write will need a light touch in editing. How do you build yourself into someone on whom you can rely, in the best of times and the worst, in peace and in war? How do you build for yourself the kind of character that will not ally itself in its suffering and misery with all who dwell in hell? The questions and answers continued, all pertinent, in one way or another, to the rules I have outlined in this book. Convenient. The remaining Q&A pairs are included without explanation. Not sure why they don't get linked back to the rules or elaborated on, but whatever. What shall I do to strengthen my spirit? Do not tell lies or do what you despise. But isn't challenging yourself sometimes having to do something you despise? building character and all that. Also, Peterson and I are just going to disagree on this. Sometimes you have to lie. Difference between chaotic good and lawful neutral, I guess. What shall I do to ennoble my body? Use it only in the service of my soul. This one could really use some elaboration. I can think of many scenarios where Peterson would probably think that the use of the body would not be soul-serving. What shall I do with the most difficult of questions? Consider them the gateway to the path of life. What's the sound of one hand clapping? What shall I do with the poor man's plight? Strive through right example to lift his broken heart. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, definitely. Living your life in the right manner will absolutely make that person living on the street feel loads better. What shall I do when the great crowd beckons? Stand tall and utter my broken truths. The ending of the Rise of Jordan Peterson documentary makes a bit more sense now. I'm thrilled and honored to bring up Dr. Jordan Peterson, everybody. Oh good, we're finally done. Can I have my pen back? No!
Pearson wraps up the book by saying that he still has this pen of light, but he hasn't used it since. Probably much to that friend's chagrin. He ends with the hopes he has for the reader, starting with the perceived utility of the book, then... I hope it revealed things you knew that you did not know you knew. I hope the ancient wisdom I discussed provides you with strength. I hope it brightened the spark within you. I hope you can straighten up, sort out your family, and bring peace and prosperity in your community. I hope, in accordance with Rule 11, do not bother children when they're skateboarding, that you strengthen and encourage those who are committed to your care instead of protecting them to the point of weakness. I wish you all the best and hope that you can wish the best for others. What will you write with your pen of light? This video series, apparently? Although I don't have a light-up pen, my keyboard's backlit, if that counts. As I mentioned, we'll end my 12 rules series with a comprehensive summary, but we can address his ending for now. One last little sneaky yuging. Uncovering that collective ancestral knowledge you somehow have tucked away up there. To respond to a relatively common comment from the lobster stands, I understand that this book has done at least some of these things for some of the people who've read it. And if it helped them improve their lives, cool. I'm glad it did. But I have concerns about the subtext or implications in many parts. I also worry that these have shifted some readers' beliefs or mentality to be more in line with Peterson's inferred conservative mindset. Or that some parts are accepted as scientific fact because Dr. Peterson told them it was such in this book, when in reality the fact was misinterpreted or misrepresented by Peterson. In Rule 9, Peterson said he didn't want his client to be the living embodiment of his damned ideology. I wonder if the same holds true for this book's readers. Alrighty, that is it for this video. And do the YouTube dance just for old time's sake. Like, comment, subscribe. Yes, subscribe. Good. Uh, Twitter, Discord, Patreon. Links for everything are in the description box. And see you guys next time. Bye.